Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here at Free Chapel. And I just want to say how wonderful it is to be able to eat again. Eat whatever you want to eat. Don't forget about the fact that God saw your fasting last month and He is going to bless you because you sought His face and asked for His will. And one of the things we love to do is we come right out of the fast and we go right into our family series, our marriage series, our home and family. And, and, and we also remember those of you who are single that you know that God has a great plan for you. And what we're saying in this series that is all about family and marriage and God's plan for the family is it's better together. And we're excited today to have one of the greatest marriage speakers that I personally have ever heard. He's my favorite in so many ways. I love this man. He's kind. He's brilliant. He's very powerful. And he's no stranger to Free Chapel. He's going to preach to you not just out of great knowledge and wisdom, but his own marriage and his own family and his own life speak for them, speaks for itself. I like to hear from veterans who know what they're talking about and they've lived what they have preached. His name is Dr. Mark Rutland. Would you stand to your feet and would you put your hands together with me and would you give a big cheer for the one and only Dr. Mark Rutland. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, please be seated. Thank you, it's such a joy to be here. Thanks to you, thanks to Jensen for that gracious introduction. He's always so kind to me and welcomes me here. And, uh, and I, I love the word veteran. Isn't that a nice word? That's a euphemism for old. <laughs> but veteran sounds so much better. Just a couple of quick announcements. Don't forget prayer and worship night tonight at 5 p.m. It's going to be a great night, the visitation of the Lord. And Pastor will be back with you next Sunday. I uh, always love to play the same joke on visitors. I was walking, I go and visit around before the service, shake hands with everybody, and it never fails. There's some per person, today it was a lady, she said, I really came to hear Pastor Franklin. I said, ma'am, I am Jensen Franklin. I just had a really rough week. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn to Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, the Ephesians letter, chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 18 following to the end of the chapter. Ephesians 5 and 18, right straight through to the end of the chapter, verse 33. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife, see that she reverence her husband. 
Put your hands on your Bible, if you will, and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, with our hands on the word and our hearts and minds as open as we know how to get them, we ask you to do all the rest. Brush aside every barrier to divine communication that we may hear from you and be changed in the mighty name, Jesus, the strong son of God. Amen. Amen and amen. There are those words, the emotional impact of which infinitely exceeds their mere definition. Given the certain context or situation, they may cause a great emotional response that's not indicated by the word itself. In, uh, in Christian circles, for example, I can go into, onto the platform of any church anywhere. I don't know what kind of church it is, what denomination, what the sign out front says, anything. And I can say one of just a few words and given the response in the house, I can pretty much tell you where I am. Here's one, miracles, signs, and wonders. I can just kind of tell where I am. Here's one that really separates the sheep from the goats, the gift of tongues. I can say that, and depending on how everybody responds, I can pretty much tell you what the sign out front says. Now, here's a word that works with Christian married couples. The word is submission. The minute I say it, the air just crackles with electricity. <laughs> About a third of the people in the room say to themselves, yeah, now he's going to straighten her out. And about a third of the people in the room say, oh, I knew this was coming. Sooner or later, I knew he'd stick it to us. About a third of the people in the room are clueless. They just feel the energy. They're saying, what, what? It comes from Ephesians 5 and 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. Every man in the room say, hallelujah. hallelujah. Lady, if that's your husband's favorite verse of scripture, you have to understand, it is delicious. <laughs> the problem is the context. Nobody wants to read Ephesians 5 and 21. Submit yourselves to each other. Now just take a ballpoint pen and let's mark that out. I know God did not mean that, so. So the problem with the word submission is, in my opinion, it has been largely hijacked mostly by male teachers who teach a very one-dimensional approach to the word submission and therefore cause an unnecessary, angry, knee-jerk reaction largely by female listeners. So it's important that we invest ourselves in understanding what it really means. So here's what goes wrong. He goes off to men's retreat with the men from Free Chapel. And he gets saved, born again. He, is he saved? It's not a trick question. Is he saved? No, it's not a trick question. Is he saved? Is he walking in spirit-filled maturity and judgment? See, there's like a gap. So in the way home from the men's retreat, some nincompoop shows him Ephesians 5 and 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. He says, if you'd have showed me that verse, I'd have been a Christian years ago. He says, all I ever wanted was what I wanted. So he goes home and announces he's saved. Great, everybody's happy. Nobody wants daddy to be going to hell. They're all delighted, daddy's saved but it doesn't take them two weeks to find out that he's the same selfish pig he was before he got saved. He's just a saved selfish pig. So now he acts all religious. If you oppose me on this, you're not opposing me. You're opposing the word of God. And he bends his wife and kids backward over the New Testament. Can you see why that energizes some resentment against a male God that's on daddy's side? So it's gonna be important that we go back behind that word and figure out what Paul was really talking about. So let's take it out of the context of scripture and put it in a different context. Let's suppose this is not Sunday morning at the Great Free Chapel Church, but that it is the first day of class in a university setting. And I say to you, look at the bottom of your syllabus 
You see that on the last day of class, you must submit to me a 30 page typed term paper, double spaced, research done, bibliography, footnotes, everything. This is not high school. I'm not mentioning it again. Submit it on the last day of class. You work all semester. You prepare a flawless manuscript. You put it in your briefcase and take it to class on the last day. And the professor says, I told you, judgment day was coming. Submit your term paper. You have it, it's in your possession, and it's perfect. You only have to do one thing to fail the course. Just don't turn it in. So when he says, submit your term paper to me, take out the two-syllable word submit and put in a one-syllable word. He means, give it to me. Give it to me. So if A equals B, then B equals A. Paul says, wives, give yourselves unto your husbands as if you were married to Jesus. Now, ladies, I've met some of your husbands. And I know that's going to be a bigger stretch for some of you than others. Indeed, he says, give yourselves to each other. He says it is the entire secret of spirit-filled living. Give yourselves to God in worship. Give yourselves in singing hymns and psalms. Give yourselves to each other in marriage. Give yourselves to each other in relationship. In other words, the, the secret of marriage is actually the secret of spirit-filled living, which is giving. In fact, when it comes to verse 25, Paul even takes out the verb submit and inserts the word give. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, here's the next hang up. Is the husband the head of the household? Well, it says right there in Ephesians, he is. The husband's the head of the household. We're not voting on this, girls. The husband's the head of the household. But how does he get to be the head of the household? It says he becomes the head of the household just as Jesus became the head of the church. How did Jesus become the head of the church? Ascend to the pinnacle of the temple and say, all right, down you dogs, worship me or I'll melt you like wax. <laughs> no, he did not. Jesus did not become the head of the church by ascending to the pinnacle of the temple. He became the head of the church by ascending to the cross. Yes, brother, you get to be the head of the household which means you have to be the most crucified person in the family. Men never yell hallelujah at that. I don't, I don't know. See, as long as marriage is based on the underlying, the fundamental concept of getting my way, it's a competition to see who's in charge. Once that is crucified, and that crucifixion does not begin with the wife. It does not begin with the kids. It begins with the head of the household. Once that competition to get my way is crucified, now I can live in the essence of spiritual living in terms of my marriage, which is giving. Now, the challenge is this. How does it work? I mean, all of that is theoretical. How does it work? Some people want it to work by law. They want to just learn the rules. Americans have a veritable lust for rules. Go through, look at Christian books, the 19 steps, the four keys, the 13 solutions. We, we love that stuff. The problem is you can't master sacrificial spirit-filled giving with rules. Take, for example, financial giving. Is tithing a rule? Is tithing a rule? I believe in tithing. I practice tithing. I preach tithing. I believe in tithing. But I hear people say all the time, that's Old Testament. That's the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace. I never argue with them. I say, you are so right. Absolutely. We're not under the law. This is grace. I just have one question for you. Does grace give less than the law or more than the law? It's at that point that many of them say, you know, I am under the law. No, giving is not about following the rules. I see people give all the time in a way that you can tell they're following the rules. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm saying it takes the joy out of it. I don't know who counts the offering here, but you ever get those checks? $436.16. What's up with that? 
I'll tell you what's up with that. He sits down with his paycheck and a calculator and multiplies the amount by 0.1 and writes the check. Here, God, here's your tithe and not one penny more. Come on, round it up. That's actually the way it is in marriage too. You can't make spirit-filled, submitted marriage work by memorizing the rules. So here's how it works. Here's a couple, they have a fight over breakfast, an argument. He leaves for work. He's um, some auto mechanic. He leaves for the garage and leaves her there. Five minutes away from the house, he has totally forgotten that argument. Now listen to me, girls. I'm going to teach you something. <laughs> Men do not have the intellectual capacity to remember an argument. He's not faking. He cannot remember it. It's God's little joke on women. Five minutes from the house, he's forgotten the argument. She remembers arguments for like decades. <laughs> Everything, every word, every syllable. All day she's rehearsing that argument. She thinks about the way his eyebrow went up. <laughs> when the corners, his mouth that just made the palm of her hand tingle. All day, you ever see a really angry woman vacuum a carpet? <laughs> Looks like bayonet practice. <laughs> She emptied the dishwasher. It looks like Frisbee golf. She's she been chewing on that all day. He gets finished at work. He's had a horrible day. Everything's gone wrong. His female boss yelled at him. One of the customers got angry. He messed up one of the projects. He barked his knuckles on an engine. And he's bleeding. He's miserable. He drives home, pulls up in his driveway. And he says, a man's home is his castle. The bride of my youth is waiting for me with love and supper and comfort. He throws the door open and he says, baby, I'm home. Give me a kiss. She looks at him, his hair in his eyes, grease to his elbows, sweat under his. She's thinking not on your best day. But she says, you want a kiss? You want a kiss? I'm going to give you a kiss and I want you to know why. I have been to every marriage conference in 19 states. And if there's one thing I've learned, it is, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. So I'm going to give you a kiss because I want you to know who the Christian in this family is. So she stomps across the floor and there in the name of Jesus. Don't you know that reaches him? But there's another way. There's another way. She couldn't look at him and that argument hanging like an iceberg in the air between them. She looks at him and she look at him. Big old dumb thing. He's so stupid. He doesn't even know I'm mad at him. He's not faking. He's discouraged. He's had a bad day. His hand is bleeding. He wishes to God his mother was here. She's not here, so I'm going to have to be a comfort to him. She says, you want to kiss, big boy? I'll give you a kiss. She lets that argument melt, and her heart melts, and she races across the kitchen floor, grabs the old boy by both ears, and bends him backward over the dining room table, and class A rings his chimes. Now is she submitted? Now she's submitted. Not because she obeyed the law, but because of the spirit of sacrificial giving. Now, how does it work for the husband? So the husband says it's the first day of deer season. You can color me gone. I'm in the woods, baby. I haven't missed the opening day in 20 years. She says, please don't go. Two of the kids have got diphtheria. <laughs> the take back man is coming for the car. Please don't leave me here with two sick kids and no automobile. He says, I'm the head of the household. I'm going, I'm going to the woods. Listen to me, brother. That's not King Jesus. That's King Kong. <laughs> I 
Now I got a word for the single folks here. I can see single people as I was talking all over the room. I could see or read their minds. I say, I'm never getting married. It's... <laughs> I see the problem is people that have never been married, they, they, especially the boys, they think marriage is mainly about one thing. <laughs> and there is that one thing. And it's, it's great. But you'd be astonished the longer you're married that there's a whole bunch of other stuff. It's the other stuff. And there's lots more of the other stuff than there is to just jumping into bed. And, and jumping into bed won't solve anything. Men think it solves everything. They said, baby, we've been fighting all day. Let's, uh, let's make love. No, a woman cannot get there, brother. You got to hear what I'm telling you. No. See, for men, they think sex fixes everything. Like world peace and everything. <laughs> no. I said, I'll tell you right now what's wrong with these Palestinians. They're not getting enough sex. That's what. <laughs> he says, I'm just about ready to strap some dynamite. No, it never. No. <laughs> but single men, single men think that's, that's what it's all about. And it's there. I don't want to minimize that. It's there. God blesses it. God gave it to us. And Jesus is great. But, but there's all this other stuff. You, you, you got to be together, live together, talk together. And if you, and you single folks, listen to what I'm saying. If you get desperate just to be married, you'll make a mistake. You'll settle for anything just to be married. Look, singleness is not a curse. Singleness should be honored and revered in the Christian community. We had a few lightweights that did all right single. I don't know, Jesus, St. Paul, there were a few. So singleness is not the worst thing that can happen to somebody. Ask a woman who's married to a brow-beating, angry, mean, selfish pig. Ask her if singleness is the worst thing that can happen. No, I'm telling you, you get your own single house in order. You get healthy. You get well. You learn spirit-filled living. You walk with God and let God bring that person. Now, how do we handle those moments where what I want and what my spouse wants are running into each other? The problem is we say this passage of scripture all the time with regard to finances and we forget it's about everything in life. Give and it should be given unto you. Give and wait for the harvest. With money, we believe that. And then we want to give something. We want to just be, say something nice to our wife. And then all of a sudden we expect a hundred percent return on that investment. We give and give and give and keep giving and keep giving. And the problem is we're afraid that We'll be the only ones in the marriage giving. We would say, Lord, what about, what about him? What about her? Are they giving? God will not answer you. God will never answer that question. He never deals with us in terms of how he's dealing with anybody else. He says, I'm only talking to you. So you just keep giving and giving and giving and believing that God will bring, will honor his promise that the, that the harvest will come. Marriage is, actually a, marriage is actually not a competition to see who gets their way. It's a race to outgive one another. So, listen to me, sister. One of the things your husband wants, well, we know one of the things he wants, but <laughs> one of the other things, he wants your admiration. He wants your admiration. You say, well, everybody wants admiration. No, but I'm telling you, the male appetite for admiration is different. When he mows the grass, comes in the house, I mowed the grass. Don't say, that's good. Did you clean the garage? <laughs> no, you just ruined it. Step out on the front porch and say, oh, baby, look. Mm. Get this yard. 
Nobody most likely. Look at the edging on that sidewalk. Hmm. You just get upstairs and get you a shower, big boy. That's what. Now that's what he wants to hear. That's giving. And you, brother, listen to Dr. Mark. I'm going to help you. Valentine's is coming. Listen to what I'm teaching. She walks out with that new dress that she just bought. She's modeling that dress for you. She doesn't want you to peer over the top of the sports page. How much did that co cost? I'm going to confiscate your credit card. She's modeling the dress for you. When she walks in, she says, look what I bought at the mall today. You jump to your feet and say, whoa. Oh, baby, look at you. You look like a million bucks in that dress. You wear that on Wednesday night and we're going to be late to prayer meeting. <laughs> now that's what she wants to hear. There are these times when it, it just, it, it goes south and nobody can figure out how it went south. And we, I've been married 57 years, 57 years. I know your applause are for Allison, those of you that have met me. Yeah, this I've learned. The relationship, am I the, are we the only marriage that's one day you get, and you just realize the whole thing is all tangled up, everybody's mad, and you can't even figure out how it got started. Nobody else here has this situation in your life that you're just driving along in the car and you realize you're both angry and you don't know why. You've got to be able to go back to the beginning and diffuse that situation. So listen, brother, she, you come up, you get up morning, one Saturday morning and she's up ahead of you. Come down the stairs and she's sitting at the coffee table with a cup of coffee and she's got her arms crossed and patting her foot and you can see she's angry and you have no clue. You walk in and she says, I guess you're going to play golf Saturday. You're going to play golf. I'm here all alone with the kids all week and you're going to play golf. Listen to me, sister. Listen, you fire that shot over his bow. He's going to fire back. A man has a mule spirit. You grab his bridle and pull. He's just going to dig his hooves in the ground. I guess you're going to play golf. Yes. 157 holes. I'm going to play every course between here and Huntsville, Alabama. I hope I die on the ninth green. And now it's all cranked up. Why did you start that? Why not try this way, sister? Say, baby, it's Saturday. You work so hard. I'm so proud of you for how you work and provide for this family. And you need some time off. Why don't you, why don't you go play golf? And while you're gone, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send your mom to the movies. I'm going to sell the children to the gypsies. <laughs> I'm going to take a bubble bath and drench myself in that perfume you like. And I'm going to put on that midnight blue negligee that you like so much. And I'm just going to be waiting for you whenever you come home. He's still going to go. I told you that you are married to a, a stupid man. He's going to go play golf, but you will have ruined it for him. On the first tee, he's addressing that ball and he looks over at that fat slob he's playing golf with, got tobacco juice coming down the corner. He'll think about you in that negligee and he'll say, I am so stupid. <laughs> now you, brother, what about you? Somehow or another, she's angry over this. You don't, you don't need to figure it out. <laughs> you can't figure it out. I guess you're going to play golf. Who gives you the right to fire back? Why don't you detox the situation? She said, I guess you're going to play golf. You say, golf, golf, golf on a beautiful Saturday morning in April with the mockingbirds singing in the trees and the dew like diamonds on the fairway. You think I'm going to go play golf? I don't want to play golf. I want to sit right here with you and have a few cups of coffee and let's just talk. Let's talk. Let's talk about our children. 
we do have children, don't we? We have. We have. <laughs> and after we've talked and a coffee, then we're going to get dressed and we're going to go have brunch at a little women's restaurant where every other customer in there is female, and they have teacups. I can't get my big fat finger in the. And they have little tiny sandwiches with the crust cut off. I can just take one. I want to eat there. I want to eat there. And then after we eat, we're going to drive around and look at new houses. If God is with us, there'll be an open house. We can go in and walk around and look at cabinetry. Mm -hmm. And, and countertops, big expensive houses that intimidate me and make me feel inadequate. That's what I want. And then after we look at houses, you know what we're going to do, baby? We're going to the shopping mall and we're going to shop till we drop. And if you, if you love me, if you ever cared for me, you will let me stand in some really public place right at the top of an escalator and hold your purse. That's what I, that's what I want. And on the way home, when we're both exhausted and tired and nearly broke, I'm going to stop at some really dangerous looking convenience store in the parking lot full of rugged looking mud splattered pickup trucks with NRA stickers on the bumper. And inside, I'm going to go in where there are tough-looking male customers buying beer and lotto tickets, and I'm going to buy sanitary napkins. <laughs> now she knows there's nothing in that day for you. That day is all giving. That day is all for her. The whole secret of marriage is in one word, submission. But the whole problem is we got the word wrong. The word simply, no, sister, don't cheer. Let me work. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to help you. Remember, you, you got to go home with him. Let, <laughs> no, the whole secret of marriage, Paul says it's bigger than that. The whole secret of relationships. No, he says it's bigger than that. The whole secret of spirit-filled living is one word, giving. When marriage becomes about giving, the question of who's in charge simply dissolves. Give, Paul says, give to one another as you give to God, and God will give to you. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes all over the house? I'm going to ask the married couples, if you will, to join hands. Just join hands with your spouse. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray for these marriages. Lord, I don't know where everybody in this room is, but I know you know. You know those that are struggling, those that are having tension, those that are facing financial challenges. God, I pray that you will pour your spirit into them and that their marriage will be filled with sacrificial, giving love. Heal the broken. Forgive that which is wounded. Restore the spirit of sacrificial love. Lord, I pray for the single folks here. I pray that they will find peace and joy in your presence. That you will be to them husband to the husbandless and father to the fatherless. Lord, I believe you to give them peace, joy, and fullness of life. That only you, not a, not a marriage partner, only you can provide. I believe you for that, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's hardly anything that speaks more to the whole nature of the giving and sacrificial nature of Christianity than Holy Communion. If you'll take this little cup that you should have, if you'll take that, if you don't have one, if you'll quickly raise your hand, our ushers will make sure that you have one. Here's some people right down here and right there. Hold your hand up high. You see these folks? Let's make sure they have them. I want to make sure everyone has one. Communion is open communion. You don't have to be a member of Free Chapel. You don't have to be a member of any church. All you have to do is take communion in the spirit of those who take communion here, and that is of repentance and, and, for, and confession. Now, once you have it, if you'll peel away the top level of cellophane, 
and you'll find right under it this absolutely delicious wafer. And we'll all take communion together. Are you ready? Everybody, everybody been served? All right. In the night that he was betrayed, listen to me, not in the most perfect moment of the relationship, but when he had been betrayed, when he was about to be betrayed and crucified, Jesus took bread and when he had broken it, he gave thanks and then he gave it to his disciples. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Now peel open the second level for the juice that's under there. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, drink ye all of this. And every time you do it, think of me. Remember how much I gave for you. Remember my giving and live giving lives. Take, drink and rejoice. Your sins are forgiven. Now, in just a moment, they're going to pass some buckets through that you can deposit those in so that it'll be a little tidier. I think they are. Evidently, we're not doing that. But it would have been a wonderful idea, actually. We did it in the first service. I jumped to the wrong conclusion. No, we, we did that only for the people in the first service because they're much messier than you are. And we figure you know to put yours in the trash. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, and look right up here and receive a closing blessing. And now may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Ghost keep your hearts and minds in perfect peace until the day of his appearing. And until then, live in his sacrificial love. Give, and it shall be given unto you. God bless you. God bless your family. And God bless Free Chapel. an amazing message and service with Dr. Mark Rutland. I said it in the first service. I'll say it again now. I think he's hilarious. I think he's great. Definitely. And he is so real. Um, and it's a, always a pleasure to have him in the house. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I love hearing him speak. It's He's hilarious, but his message is so powerful as well. Like, I honestly... I'm taking what he said and applying it to my own marriage, and it's just truly amazing. If this is your first time accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please text us yes to 510-510. We would love to connect with you. Um, and also, if you have any prayer requests, anything at all, we have an entire team dedicated to just praying over any requests that you have. Send your prayer request to 510-510 um, by saying prayer, and we'll make sure that the team will, you know, accompany you in praying um, as well. Yeah, and if you want to support the ministry, we would love to, ha to have you support, and you can do so by giving. Yes. And you can do so by multiple different avenues, which will be listed, and we would love for you to support. Yes, no, and, and honestly, whatever God puts in your heart to give, um, it's so amazing to see what our church really does um, to, with the, to outreach the community as well with that. So, um, yeah, yeah. Give, go ahead and give whatever God places in your heart in any means that you can. And honestly, this service was amazing, and I'm so excited for next yeah. week to hear from Pastor Jensen. We are so excited for this series to continue, yes. and you do not want to miss out all of the amazing and powerful messages that are going to be going on throughout the month of February. Yes. And like Fabid said, we have our very own Pastor Jensen so sharing exciting. the message next Sunday. And you want to tune in because you don't want to miss out. Yes. See you, see you next week. We'll see you next week, everyone. Have a blessed day.